Now for something completely different. It's ironically somewhat the same topic, but I'm going to try and do a lot more Indians, a lot more audience involvement. I'm going to be talking about governance models or business models, which in the end are pretty much the same thing. And I'm going to try to tell you the story of ICANN in about three minutes. And then I'd like to do Q&A, because some of you know this or think you know it or, anyway. Uh, I was chairman of ICANN back in 1998 to 2000. This was the organization, Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers, that was supposed to basically be the regulatory infrastructure for the technical part of the internet, the, the actual IP addresses and the names. And the names, of course, they were sort of like a little asset. They were kind of like NFTs that pointed to a domain name and the related IP addresses and you could put stuff there. And of course, that became an interesting market. Domain name like coca-cola.com was worth a lot, especially to Coca-Cola. So they hired a bunch of lawyers to protect it. And this had been going on until 1998. The US government and the EU together decided this, this really needs to be governed and we don't want it to be governed by a government we wanted to be governed by the broad internet community. And so they kind of encouraged the broad internet community to come together and it didn't. <laughs> the techies said, just leave us alone, it's working fine. The business people said, keep your hands off our internet. The non-US and EU people said, we don't want it run by you guys in uh, Eastern Europe and Western Europe and the US. So the whole thing was conceived in a kind of immaculate conception of lack of transparency. The patron saint of the internet, John Postel, who had run this system up to that point, had heart surgery in September of 98 and died, not mysteriously, of complications. So the, the DNA of this outfit was basically set by the lawyers at Jones Day who were implementing this whole thing. They tried to pick a board of people who were not part of the factions, uh, which was always why I was picked. I knew something about technology, but I wasn't really a fighter on any particular side. Uh, the rest of the people knew even less than I did, with the exception of Vince Cerf and a guy called Jun Marai from Japan. So our first mistake was to hold closed board meetings. Our second mistake was for one of the board members, Hans von Kreienbrink, to say, this is so silly because if we have open board meetings, we'll just make all the decisions at dinner the night before. <laughs> Which of course was totally true, but it wasn't really politic to say this in public. Uh, to make what is already a long story short, the thing turned into a protection racket. The people who showed up at the meetings to govern it, to set the prices and ultimately to expand the number of top level domain names were naturally enough registries, registrars, lawyers, copyright lawyers, and people who had a vested interest. They tried to create the at large advisory council, which was supposed to represent the public, but hey, they weren't paid to show up. It wasn't in their financial interest to do so. It wasn't stuff they really cared about. So it ended up being run pretty much by a bunch of insiders. Uh, good news is, the protection racket took a lot of money, but again, in the context of people's lives, it wasn't that important to most people. And second, they did not take people's voices, though governments certainly are able to do that because people physically live within their territories. And as I said earlier, Russia, China, lots of places are excellent examples of that. So the question is, how do we, how do, we do this better? And why don't I start not answering questions? I'm not sure I have any answers, but at least responding to them from my experience with ICANN, with later on the proposed sale of .org, which was a nonprofit, which uh, to some people is again a, an ethical horror. Uh, can you easily or effectively mix Profits and nonprofits. 
that happens, I find it really tough. I mean, it works okay if you have a museum with a gift shop, but beyond that, it gets difficult. So somebody raise your hand and ask a compelling question or make a compelling response. Great, yeah, and just shout it out. Maybe someone will give you a mic or maybe you just need to shout. Just stand up and we have five minutes left, though I'm happy to talk outside. There is a chance for China and Russia to develop their own internet. Why would they do it? What's the motivation for other countries to develop, develop different standards and a competitive market? Um, their, their motivation is less to compete, but to wall themselves, both protect, protect their control within and protect themselves from inconvenient truths coming from without. It's, it's less a technical issue than, you know, we don't want people reaching our citizens, whether it's with, I remember, and this is why I don't think I let me into China, saying that Google was right to go into China to try and bring better information to the Chinese, and it was also right to leave when the Chinese would not let it do so. Uh, so it's, I mean, what you see in Russia now is, you know, a flight from reality because they don't want to wake up to the reality that they are not a superpower. Somebody else? Who, who has this? Yeah, great, in the back. I was wondering if you think that blockchain requires any sort of revisiting of like how we define uh, non Kind of see a world where launching tokens enables you to develop like public good systems, uh, which you know, we can in one way think about as this nonprofit, uh, but there can be you know, financial implications. I'm just curious if you think that blockchain requires revisiting that definition. Um, matching the blockchain to our definition, yeah. I mean, the the question with a nonprofit is who. Who created it is not supposed to be who controlled it. I mean, this is the problem Trump gets into when he creates a supposed nonprofit and then hires relatives. Uh, so in theory, yeah, the definition of a nonprofit is it should not be for your own benefit. And very good question. I mean, clearly, if you have a token, again, a token is not... This is where you get into securities law, you know, because a token is not, it's kind of semi-fungible <laughs> because you can sell it back. So you've got a financial interest in it. In theory, you've got a voting interest, uh, but you certainly haven't given it away for the benefit of somebody else, which is when you start getting the tax deductions and the, the freedom. So to be honest, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know where that stands, but I would not call, you know, a DAO ultimately profits the people with the tokens if that's how it's arranged. You can have different structures. I mean, like the DAO that was supposed to buy the Constitution and then donate it somewhere was something created for a specific nonprofit purpose where they were supposed to have no control over what happened. And then, of course, it didn't happen, and I don't know where it is now. But yeah, it. It raises really interesting questions that I think require further discussion. A nonprofit is supposed to benefit the beneficiaries who are not the owners. And the whole NFT DAO thing basically is about how you define control rather than ownership. And there's millions of ways to define control, some of which accord with the law in various jurisdictions and some of which don't. So, yeah, if, if you want to be a success, it's not plastics, it's not code, it's law. The, um, somebody in the front row, yeah. I have a question about, um, I'm just really curious, to what extent do you think that people have, uh, you know, a sort of control of how Web3 will be developed in terms of like governance-wise? Because the way I see it now is more about like algorithms, 
predicting consumerism and then like people are just following all this intelligent um, algorithms that are predicting them. So just really curious how do you see the people being able to like drift from all these data, you know, algorithms that are already able to work. Yeah, I don't see all people having control and that's what bothers me. And I think the solution is less Certainly it's more transparency, but it's also people being more able to understand what is actually going on, which you know, they usually don't. The, the way I'd best like to describe it is I want to give people the power to manipulate themselves rather than giving that over to people whose interest is in manipulating people so they can make money off them. You know, and that's where you get people selling addictive drugs and addictive games and addictive gambling services that sometimes call them investing services and so forth and so on. Uh, and I think there's somebody else coming up in two minutes, so I'm ready to cede my platform, but I'll answer that last question in the back when whoever is next comes up. Um. So the question was about TikTok and what does that, and the U.S. government saying, stay out. Uh, it's, you know, like it or not, it's it's kind of like China saying it doesn't want stuff from outside. Uh, I'm an American. I'm very suspicious of what TikTok is doing, and so I'd happen to agree with it. I'd, I'd be happier to see some clear explanation of the action they're taking and why. But it goes, I mean, it goes back to TikTok being addictive, uh, being toxic for kids, you know, kind of like what we're complaining about with Facebook as opposed to Meta, the company, Facebook, the service, and Instagram making, you know, it, addiction is not about a substance. It's about a person's relationship to something, whether it's food or alcohol or how you feel about yourself after you see 29 other girls like yourself who are much prettier that make you feel inadequate and watching kids commit suicide and so forth and so on. And that's where we need, and we is not the people in this room. We unfortunately is not the entire country either, but we need to start thinking seriously about all these issues around manipulation and exploitation and so forth and so on. Uh, again, I think someone else is supposed to come up here and take the stage, so. But I'm happy to keep. That was Esther Dyson, ladies and gentlemen. And she was on the board of the Google of Russia. And a few days before the Ukraine was invaded, she went to Russia and resigned. And you could ask her more about that. And she's just a world citizen. She trained to be a cosmonaut. So she, she, for months, but she was the backup and the person ended up going. So they didn't get to have her. So we don't have her circulating, you know, circumnavigating the earth, but maybe next time. But ladies and gentlemen, Esther Dyson. Right. And, and thank you for what you did for Web2. Do you feel like we have the bones of something that over the next 24 months can be helpful for Web3? Um, I would like it to be helpful for the next 10 years. Okay, all right, That's the, those are big, yeah, she threw down the gauntlet, ladies and gentlemen. All right, exit, yep, fine. All right, so this is a 100-year-old MIT yearbook, and I, it's 1923, and I looked through every page of it, and Web3 is not mentioned anywhere, okay? We're gonna make history. Um, and I see, is um, Grace here? Where are you, where's Grace? So Grace is right there. So we have a full professor from Stanford who's gonna speak here a little bit. She was a Stanford undergrad who was one of the top scouts for venture. She just flew in, runs Lux Capital uh, in the Web3 space. So while we're all about MIT here, and we're at MIT, we also love that we have our, our friends from other institutions representing, and she's gonna be hosting in a second.